Okay, let's go and get started today. This is class six. Uh, happy Monday. Uh, hopefully everybody's uh, doing okay on their quizzes. I am going to spend some time going over those uh, in a video at the next the beginning of next class because I want to make sure everybody is up to speed. I know some people missed a few things on those, so I'll be going over those. But this video, we're just going to focus on the uh, uh, the topic that we want to get through today. And let's uh, quickly get through this. All right, so last time we talked about uh, direct proof. And if you remember with direct proof, we start off with some kind of given or hypothesis, and we work towards some goal or conclusion. And then each of these steps, so anywhere we have P implying, in this case, P1 implying P2 implying however many steps it takes, every one of these steps has to be justified. It's like a chain. If any one of these is not properly justified, the whole proof falls apart. And uh, if we can justify each of those steps, then we've proven the entire, uh, the entire statement P uh, implies Q. In other words, uh, if P then Q or Q is deduced from P. So we, but we can't just claim that without having uh, a chain of steps that prove that. Now, as a reminder of how direct proof works, we start with a hypothesis. We work towards the conclusion or goal. Uh, we justify each step, and every step has to be justified with some legitimate argument or, in the case of what we were doing with regular expressions, some sort of manipulation uh, or in math, algebra or something. In other words, it has to be justified. You can't just say, uh, this step is true because uh, Paul said it in class, or this step is true because I read it on the internet somewhere. There has to be an argument associated with it other than... Uh, somebody said this somewhere, or because it feels right, you have to uh, do that. And we're going to use that later on in the class to prove things about uh, languages uh, and automata. And I apologize, there's a dog walking around behind me there. Uh, now, what we're going to focus on today is another technique called proof by contradiction. And the way proof by contradiction works is we start by assuming whatever proposition we're trying to true, we start by assuming the negative of that, or uh, that we start by assuming that it's false rather than true, and then we work towards showing that it cannot be true that it's false, which means, therefore, it must be true. And sometimes it's easier to do that than it is to prove something directly. Uh, this is also known as uh, indirect proof because we're not proving the actual claim itself. We're proving that the negation of the claim has to be false, so therefore the claim itself has to be true. And that whole idea is based on the fact that something cannot be both true and false at the same time. So if the opposite or the negation of a claim is false, we know the claim has to be true. The converse works as well. If we know a claim has to be false, we know its negation has to be true. And we have to be a little bit careful on what we mean by negation. But uh, the idea is if we have some statement we want to prove, like P implies Q, and there it is, P implies Q, we start by assuming the, the negation of that. We're saying P implies not Q, or the opposite of that uh, of Q. So if we can show that P implies not Q has to be false, then that assumption uh, itself, the meaning the negation, the P not Q, is false. So therefore, the original statement has to be true. So we're trying to prove this, but we focus on this instead. And if we can prove this must be false, that means that this has to be true. And to get a little bit more visceral understanding of that, because it, it seems a little strange, it seems like a, a trick uh, when you first see it, let's look at an example. And this example isn't really much of a, as much of a proof as it is a, uh, uh, just an example to show what the negation of something means. So in this case, let's say we have this uh, example where we're taking the cube root of this number, and we want to know, is that less than or equal to 13? Now, we could just get out a calculator and compute that, but let's follow me through this, and we'll do it kind of in a little bit different way. Let's say that we, uh, this cube root could be a hard thing to calculate, but we don't really need to do the cube root because we have this uh, equation here. We can just cube both sides. So we're going to take both sides, raise it to the third power. So the cube root and the cube are going to cancel each other out. 
And then we just have to do compute 13 cubed, which is easier to do than that cube root. So now we wind up with this 2,198 less than or equal to 2,197. Now that is clearly false. 2,198 is bigger than 2,197. But notice we were focused on this less than or equal thing. But notice in doing that calculation, we have now proven that since that's not true, we've now proven the negation must be true, which means the cube root of the original thing we started with has to be greater than, which is the negation of this. What's the opposite of this being less than or equal to that? Well, it's this being greater than that. So we've shown that this is true. So notice that that shows kind of how the logic works of this negation. We're saying we, we did all our calculations with this less than or equal, but since that came out not true, that has to mean that this opposite thing is true. And that's the concept behind proof by contradiction is that we're always going to, we're going to take our original thing that we want to show, maybe this, we're going to assume the opposite or the negation of that. And negation doesn't mean just make everything negative. It means the kind of the opposite logical statement, logically negated uh, um, contradiction of that. And then we're going to show that that's not the case, which means the first thing has to be true. Now let's do a little more useful example. And this is a kind of a classical uh, example of proof by contradiction. Maybe you've seen this before in some other class, but let's go through it anyway. So we want to prove that the square root of two is irrational. And just as a quick, uh, kind of reminder, uh, irrational means that there, you, you do not have two integer, uh, numbers that when divided by each other, one divided by the other, equals the square root of two. An irrational number is one where there is no such set of integers that could ever do that. Now that might seem to be strange, like how could we ever prove that? Because there's an infinite number of integers that we can plug in for a and b. In other words, the, the top part of the fraction and the bottom part, the numerator and denominator. So since there are an infinite number of both of those, we can't try all of them to see if any of them equate to square root of two. So we need to a little more complex proof to prove that. So what we're going to do is we're going to assume the negation, which in this case, square root of two is irrational. The opposite of that is let's assume that it's rational, which means that we're assuming that the square root of two, there exists a case where square root of two is equal to some integer divided by some integer where a and b are integers with no prime factors. And that no prime factors thing is going to end up being somewhat important for this proof because notice if there were prime factors, we could reduce these to lowest terms uh, and have something with no prime factors. Because So we could always put any fraction into a form where there aren't any prime factors. All right, so moving on with this proof, we've assumed that this is true. So with that assumption of that being true, let's just manipulate this with a little bit of algebra. So let's multiply both sides by b. So that's going to take the b out of the denominator here and cancel that out, and it's going to move a b over to the other side. So in other words, we just uh, moved the b to the other side of the equal sign. And now we have square root of 2 times b equal a. So in other words, we multiplied both sides with a v, b's cancel out over here, and now we have square root of 2 times b on the other side. So now let's take the square, uh, or square both sides. So to get rid of the square root, we're going to square both sides, which is going to give us 2b squared, because the square root of 2 uh, squared is going to, that's going to uh, become 2. Square root of 2 squared is 2. And then b squared, or b squared is b, b squared. And then on the other side, since we squared this side, we need to square this side, so we get a squared. So now we have this uh, form here. But you'll notice that there's something interesting here. We know that b is an integer, so now we have an integer squared times 2. Well, that is itself the definition of an even number. So we know now that a squared is an even number. So that means that a is an even number. So thus a, because any even number times an even number, as we showed in the last class, results in an even number. So a squared is even, therefore a is even. So in this case, a has to be an even number. Now we're going to come back to that in a second. So if a is an even number, then we can think of a as 2 times k. So a itself, if we know it has to be an even number, we can say, well, that's 2 times some other number k, where k is another integer. 
In other words, that's a definition of an even number. It has a, it's a multiple of two. It has two as a factor. So now let's, so here's this, the chain. I've just collapsed this and took out some of the space so we can see it. So we started out with this assumption. We said multiply both sides by B. We got that. We took the square of both sides and got that. And then now we're substituting that 2K for A because A has to be even because you can see there's a 2 over there on that side. So if A has to be even, we can substitute 2K for that. And now we get 2B squared equal 4K uh, squared. And now we're going to divide both sides by 2. And that's going to get rid of the 2 over here, cut the 4 in half over here. We have b squared equal 2k. But now notice we have something interesting uh, here that we now have b has to be even because there's a multiple of 2 on the other side that we're setting it equal to. And since b squared is even, b has to be even. So that b also has to be even, which means that both a and b are even. And therefore, they both have to have 2 as a common factor, which means it was impossible for them to have no common factors as described. And notice that that's a really interesting uh, contradiction we just found. We, found. we said, let's assume that there is uh, an integer a and b with no common factors, which means they cannot both be even numbers. And then when we did the manipulation, we showed that, well, both a has to be even and b has to be even. And since that's impossible, if these had no common factor, Therefore, this has to be false. So thus, our claim of rationality has to be false. So there is no uh, thing. So therefore, the uh, number, the square root of 2, has to be irrational. And then you'll notice we end that proof with QED, uh, which basically stands, means that we have demonstrated what we set out to demonstrate. Uh, it's like stands for uh, quotas at demonstratum or something like that, which means we have uh, what we have done has demonstrated uh, the, what we've set out to demonstrate. But notice that that square root of 2 has to be irrational because we found a contradiction when we assumed that it was rational. And so this, uh, this method of proof is, uh, let me go back for just a second. This method of proof is really powerful. We're going to use this later on in the course um, in dealing with languages. We're not quite to the point where we're going to use this yet, but keep this in mind um, as a technique, that sometimes a direct proof is difficult. For example, if we tried to prove that square root of uh, 2 is irrational directly, like how would we go about doing that? Um, that's a, a much more difficult proposition because there are no integers over each other. So we say, let's assume that it is rational. And then we show that it's impossible for that to have been true, which means that therefore it's irrational. So some Sometimes it's uh, difficult to get directly from a thing with a chain of uh, implications, like with a direct proof, but you can switch to an indirect proof or, or proof by contradiction and show that a chain of events leads you to a place where that had your original assumption had to have been impossible, which means the uh, original, the opposite of that, has to be true. All right, this is a very uh, cool technique, very powerful in certain situations. All right, now one other thing that's related to that that I want to mention here is the concept of counterexamples. And that can be used to prove something false. So uh, with a counterexample, if we can find a single example that violates whatever our conjecture is, then we know the conjecture has to be false. And that's called a counterexample. And notice you could use counterexamples with uh, proof by contradiction. We could say, assume the uh, negation of this is true. Then we find a counterexample to show that that has to be false, which means the original thing is true. Now, one thing to note, though, and this is a mistake that I've seen uh, people make, is that counterexamples can prove a claim false in its entirety, but finding a single example that works doesn't prove the conjecture is true in its entirety. So uh, as a, qu a quick example to make that a little more clear, Let's look at this example, all birds can fly. So all birds can fly. So we look out our window, um, I have a window out here, and I actually can see birds out there uh, flying around. So does that prove that all birds can fly? Because I saw one bird flying. And the answer to that is obviously no. That proves that that bird can fly that I just saw, or maybe that type of bird that I saw can fly. 
But seeing that starling flying around out my window doesn't prove the conjecture to be true, that all, anything about all birds, only one bird. But if my conjecture is all birds can fly, and I go to the zoo and I see a penguin, and it can't fly, then that proves the conjecture false. So all birds can fly is false. Now that also, notice by, uh, by proof by contradiction, proves the opposite of or the negation of all birds can fly. And this is where I said earlier you have to be a little bit careful about what you mean by negation. What is the negation of the logical opposite of all birds can fly? It's not that all birds can't fly. It's that there exist some birds that can't fly, or maybe some birds can fly, but not necessarily all of them. But notice that this just single counterexample of a penguin or a dead bird or something like that could be used to prove this conjecture entirely false. But a single example of it working does not prove this uh, true. Okay, so let's use this. Uh, it, this is a kind of a, a trivial proof that we're going to do here. But let's say our conjecture is all prime numbers are odd. Can we prove that that's true? Or is there a counterexample? All right, so going through that, our conjecture, all prime numbers are odd. If A is prime, then A is odd. Or in other words, A could be written as 2 times some integer plus 1, kind of the definition of prime numbers. So can we prove that that's true, or is there a counterexample? And in this case, we take A equal 2, which 2 is a prime number. Since 2 is clearly even, the conjecture must be false. And that, that makes sense. So this conjecture, all prime numbers are odd, clearly false because we found a number, a single number, that acted as a counterexample. So this whole statement has to be false. Now that doesn't mean that all prime numbers are not odd or even. It means that the opposite of not all prime numbers are odd. Some of them may be even, some of them may be odd. In this case, there's really only one that's even. But that kind of gives you an example of kind of how counterexamples work. And again, notice that if I say all prime numbers are odd, and I say, well, well, three is a prime number, and it's odd, so therefore this has to be true. Or maybe five is a prime number, and that's odd, so this has to be true. And you could try a whole bunch of these, 13, 11, uh, just a ton of different uh, 17. You could go through a whole bunch of prime numbers and find odd ones. Finding examples might give you a little bit of confidence in the claim, but it's not a proof. But finding a single counterexample, just one, when we're talking about all prime numbers, this is clearly can't be true because I found a case where there's a number that was uh, even and prime. Okay, so the negation has to be true. Not all prime numbers are odd. And notice, just put that not in front of that, and that works. And again, going back to the, yeah, go back here for a second. All birds can fly. What's the negation of that? Not all birds can fly. Just put the not in front of that. We kind of have a negation of it. All right. Now, as I mentioned earlier, proof by contradiction and counterexamples can be used together. Uh, so if we assume a negation and we can show the negation cannot be true by finding a single counterexample, just one, then we've proven the non-negated claim to be true. And that's something that we're going to do later on in some examples uh, in things about languages later on. Uh, and... Again, automata, formal languages. Uh, this class, we're not going to do like hundreds of proofs. We're going to do a few of them to get a flavor for it. Uh, but it is useful, uh, as we talked about earlier, because proving things in a general sense can be helpful uh, in a, for doing real world uh, kind of problems, solving them using the automata and uh, formal language stuff that we're learning here. So again, in the practical side of things, proofs can still be useful because they know we know not to spend our time trying to make something work when we can prove that it's impossible. All right, we'll come back to that uh, when we circle back to automata here, not next class, but the class after. Okay, now one quick thing with proof by contradiction. Uh, the proofs are almost always structured uh, as follows. So one, the proposition to be proved is assumed to be false. So in other words, we say, put a not in front of the thing that we're trying to prove and assume that that's true. 
And then we want to show that us making that assumption that the opposite of what we we're trying to prove is true implies that we have two mutually contradictory assertions. In other words, that by assuming that this is true, that means we have to have Q be true, but at the same time, Q not be true. And since that can't both be true and not true at the same time, then that means that Again, since something can't be both true and not true at the same time, that means that our original assumption that we made, not P, has to be false, which means that P has to be true. And almost all of those proof by contradictions work the same way. And notice how that differs from direct proof. We focus on the negation of the claim. We focus on finding something that is impossible uh, or contradicts our, our argument in some way. Uh, for example, the earlier proof with the... Uh, square root of two being assumption being rational. We said, assume it's rational, assume it has no prime factors, or A and B have no prime factors, and then we proved that they both have to be even and therefore have prime factors. And since you can't have something that both has no prime factors and has prime factors, that can't be true. Both of those can't be true. The whole claim hat falls apart. The whole chain of that falls apart. And since that chain started with the... Uh, negation that it is has to be rational or the assumption that it's rational the whole thing then means it has to be irrational and notice that followed that proof followed this uh, kind of thing and that's also why this is called an indirect proof because we're not attacking the claim of truth directly we're not trying to show that directly we're just trying to show that the negation of it is impossible and if the negation of it is impossible then the uh or is false, then the original has to be true. Okay, now, we're almost done for the day. This is a relatively short uh, lecture. So I want to give you some of these uh, proof things to think about and work through. Uh, so think about that proof we did by direct proof last time. We said uh, if A and B are even numbers, then, this should say then, and I'm going to fix it. I'm now in the habit of fixing these as soon as I see a typo. Okay, so if A and B are even numbers, then A times B is also even. So we have did that with a direct proof before. So think about how you would prove that uh, indirectly or with a proof by contradiction. Another one is think about this one. This And these two are kind of related uh, to each other. Think about if N squared is odd then n must also be odd. Think about how you'd prove that by contradiction as well. And then the third one here, uh, circling back to automata, proof by contradiction that r plus is not equal to r star by contradiction. So how could you prove that r plus, no matter what language or regular expression you plug in for r, is there a way you could prove that that plus is not equal to that star. And, and then when I say no matter what, you like, you might say, well, I'm going to plug lambda in there, and lambda plus is equal to lambda star. But this, we want to have it where anything you plug in, we want to prove that that is not true, that uh, these are ever equal. In other words, you wouldn't want to have a case where you plug in something here and there and have it you want to show that that's not always, uh, or that it's always the case where this is not equal to that. I think I said that backwards, but you want to prove that this is true, and you want to prove it by contradiction. So what I want you to do uh, for class today is think about how you improve those by contradiction. Uh, that might be a good thing to work through for uh, something like a quiz. And then next class, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to move on to another proof technique uh, called proof by induction. And then we're going to circle back around to tying all this stuff back into automata and formal languages. And I know some of you, this is a review, uh, but I think it's important to be exposed to the different proof methods because we're going to be using some of those uh, later on in the semester. And I don't want to make the assumption that everybody already knows direct proof, proof by contradiction, proof by induction, uh, because we're going to use those a little bit uh, going forward. 
And those, that's going to end up being very powerful for us here before too long because, again, what it can show is that certain types of languages or families of languages, it's impossible to represent certain kind of things using those languages. And if we didn't know that and we couldn't prove that, we might spend a lot of time spinning our wheels, wasting our time trying to create something that's impossible to create with that language. And, and it's also going to lead us to an understanding of why we're going to need to expand our set of language, uh, formal language tools to other families of languages beyond that. All right, so that's it for today. Uh, that's a relatively short lecture today, but I really do want you to take a look at, oops, these things here and see if you can uh, think through how you would do a proof by contradiction. You might even want to sketch those out. That'd be something good to have for a quiz. And that's it for today. Everybody stay safe, wash your hands, uh, and we will go over the, uh, the quizzes. I think everybody has taken them at this point. So next, uh, next class at the beginning, we're going to have a, a little lecture, mini lecture going over the quizzes, and then we're going to get into proof by induction. All right, so everybody stay safe. I'll see you soon.